the goose was here and shall return. All right, Sally, hopefully you'll jump back in again. And my wife said, greetings, Sally, how are you? The goose was here and shall return. All right, Sally, hopefully you'll jump back in again. And my wife said, All right. So it looks like I have everything set up and in place. We'll see who hops in here. It is 1030. I might wait a minute or two for a few more people to jump in to get to our content at hand today. Again, as you can see, I um, want to do things just a little bit different. It's not really a, a baseball player. Notice in parentheses, I have the goose is back. How you doing, Sally? <laughs> nice to have you in the stream here with us. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> a little bit different today. Um, yeah, usually today would be my baseball player biography series. But you notice in parentheses between player and biography, it's executive. So I'm going to take a little bit of time because some people are wondering why did why did Marvin Julian Miller get inducted into the Hall of Fame? I'm going to go over that and why he was. Um, so yes, so that's what we are going to do today is uh, go over that. And then you'll know exactly why uh, I chose to do this one today. He does have a good meaning and a good reason as to why he got inducted into the Hall of Fame. All right. Um, of course, everybody knows that the reason he got elected, uh, elected in was through the Veterans Committee. And through the Veterans Committee, which consists of a panel of 16 people voting for ones that get inducted through the Veterans Committee. Um, there are 16 people currently on that panel, which started in 2018. Um, it isn't every year that they do get voted in, but it's um, through the Veterans Committee, the Expansion ERA Committee, and the Modern Day Baseball Era Committee. Okay, and so he was actually voted in through the modern baseball era committee process because he was a groundbreaking dude yes yes he was if you've read anything about marvin miller he did definitely break some ground and we will go into that in probably about a minute here um so thank you for being the first in the chat this morning there sally I like how you said the goose was here and shall return. <laughs> so without further ado, what I am going to do here is as soon as my clock says 10.33, I'm going to go into the biography for Marvin Miller. And we are going to get into that right now. Hopefully some people join us. Since you're here with me, Sally, and you're one of my mods, if you could greet people as they come in the room, if I'm not paying attention to the chat. Okay, so again, here's the picture again of Marvin Miller that I have in my collection currently. Um, So we're going to get into um, the the history or the biography of uh, Marvin Miller, okay? So here we go, a little bit of a, a capsulation. Uh, Marvin Julian Miller was born April 14th, 1917, and then he died November 27th, 2012. 
He was an American baseball executive who served as the executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association from 1966 to 1982. Under Miller's direction, the Players' Union was transformed into one of the strongest unions in the United States. In 1992, Red Barber said Marvin Miller, along with Babe Ruth and Jackie Robinson, is one of the two or three most important men in baseball history. Miller Miller was selected into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in December 2019 for induction in the year 2020. All right. So, as far as his early life, Miller was born in the Bronx on April 14, 1917 and grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Rooting for the Brooklyn Dodgers, his father Alexander was a salesman for a clothing company on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, and as a youngster, Marvin walked a picket line in a union organizing drive. His mother, Gertrude Wald Miller, who taught elementary school, was a member of the New York City Teachers Union, now the United Federation of Teachers. Miller graduated from New York University in 1938 with a degree in economics. He resolved labor management disputes for the National War Labor Board in World War II and later worked for the International Association of Machinists and the United Auto Workers. He joined the staff of the United Steelworkers in 1950 became its principal economic advisor and assistant to its president, and took part in negotiating contracts. Uh, Major League Baseball Players Association, the MLBPA, at the United Steelworkers Union, Miller worked his way up to be its leading economist and negotiator. In the spring of 1966, Miller visited MLB Spring Training Camp in an effort to be democratically elected executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association. He won that election by a vote of 489 to 136. Miller negotiated M. LBPA's first collective bargaining agreement, the CBA, with the team owners in 1968. That CBA, covering the 1968 and 1969 seasons, was a short document. If one, the players a nearly 43% increase in the minimum salary from $7,000 to $10,000, as well as larger expense allowances. More importantly, the deal brought a formal structure to owner-player relations, including written procedures for the arbitration of a player grievances before the commissioner. The next CBA, a three-year deal, was signed in 1970, Built on this gain, for the first time, owner-player disputes not involving the integrity of baseball could be arbitrated not before the commissioner, an employee of the owners, but before a three-member arbitration panel with a neutral chairman elected jointly by the players and owners. Here's where Kurt Flood comes into the picture. Throughout the 1969 season, Kurt Flood, a perennial standout player for the powerhouse St. Louis Cardinals, argued with Cardinals owner August Bush and general manager Bing Devine over a $10,000 raise in his $90,000 salary. Shortly after the 1969 season concluded, Devine sent Flood a terse two-sentence letter notifying him that he had been traded to the National League East cellar-dwelling Philadelphia Phillies. Flood took the trade as an insult and also viewed it as punishment by Cardinals management for his increased salary demands. Philadelphia's Shy Park was known to be the most dilapidated in the major leagues compared with Bush Stadium, that opened in 1966. Worse still, the Phillies fans had earned a reputation for being virulent racists, as was evidenced by the epithets and garbage they hurled at black player 
Dick Allen. So bad was Allen's treatment at the hands of the Phillies fans he took to wearing a batting helmet while playing in the field. At a conference held in his honor at New York University in 2012, Miller recalled that Flood had said to him about Philadelphia before filming, filing a lawsuit. On his experience in Philadelphia, he had observed that the people at the ballpark, patrons, were as racist as any he had ever met in the South, and he was not going to live there or work there. Coincidentally, Allen was the player for the Phils sent to St. Louis as part of the bargain for Flood. Flood wrote a letter to the then commissioner of baseball, Bowie Kuhn, stating that he did not view himself as property and instructed Kuhn to notify all teams in Major League Baseball that he was willing to consider financial offers to play for any team during the 1970 season. Flood had chosen to ignore the age-old reserve clause, which prevented him from negotiating with any MLB team until he had sat out a season. Flood did not take his challenge of the reserve clause lightly and did consult with Miller before suing Major League Baseball and Bowie Kuhn. I told him, recalled Miller, that given the courts' history of bias towards the owners and their monopoly, he didn't have a chance in hell of winning. More important than that, I, Miller, told him, even if he won, he'd never get anything out of it. He'd never get a job in baseball again. Flood asked Miller if it would benefit other players. I, Miller, told him, yes, and those to come. Flood pressed toward with his suit, and as Miller predicted, became what later generations would figuratively call radioactive. The MLBPA officially issued a statement supporting his legal battle, but none of his fellow players nor any of his friends came to his defense. As the case, Flood v. Kuhn made its way to the Supreme Court in March of 1972, Flood was represented represented by prominent labor lawyer Arthur Goldberg. A former Secretary of Labor, permanent representative to the United Nations, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and General Counsel of the United Steelworkers, while Marvin Miller was the union's chief negotiator. Meanwhile, Miller took his union, his union on a lightning strike on April Fool's Day, 1972. From April 1st through April 13th, the ball players simply stayed away from the ballparks while Miller negotiated with, their, with the owners. Baseball only resumed when the owners and players agreed on a $500,000 increase in pension fund payments. Owners agreed to add salary arbitration to the CBA. The total 86 exhibition and regular season games that were missed over the entire 13-day period were never played because the league refused to pay the players for the time they were on strike. Most teams lost anywhere from 6 to 8 games off their 162-game schedule. The Supreme Court decided against Flood by a 5-3-1 to to vote in 1972. Flood set out the 1970 season because no owner wanted to set a precedent by flagrantly disobeying the reserve clause. In 1971, he was signed by and played just 13 lackluster games for the Washington Senators. After that, a disgusted Flood never played Major League Baseball again. Twenty years later, Miller wrote in his memoir that Flood told the player un players union, I think the change in black consciousness in recent years has made me more sensitive to injustice in every area of my life. Miller also said that Flood was primarily challenging the reserve clause as a professional ball player. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, it looks like it's still just... Sally and my wife was here for a little bit. Oh, wow. <laughs> <coughs> so, the end of the reserve clause. Although he lost his personal legal battle, Flood 
had made it possible for other MLB players to challenge the reserve clause. In 1974, Miller used arbitration to resolve a dispute when the Oakland Athletics owner, Charlie Finley, failed to make an annuity payment. Our Posada's here. He's probably been watching in the background. He's usually here in stealth mode. <laughs> uh, failed to make an annuity payment as required by, Sun, by Cy Young Award winning pitcher Catfish Hunter's contract. The arbitrator ruled that Finley had not met the terms of the contractor, so Hunter was free to negotiate a new contract with any team, making Hunter a free agent. Hunter eventually went to sign a five-year deal with the New York Yankees for $3.5 million and an additional million dollar signing bonus. In 1974, Miller encouraged two other pitchers, Andy Messersmith of the Los Angeles Dodgers and Dave McNally of the Baltimore Orioles to play out the succeeding year without signing a contract. After the year had elapsed, both players filed a grievance arbitration. The ensuing seats decision declared that both players had fulfilled their contractual obligations and ha- had no further legal ties to their ball clubs. This effectively eradicated the reserve clause and ushered in free agency. As an economist, Miller clearly understood that too many free agents would actually drive down players' salaries. Miller agreed to limit free agency to players with more than six years of service, hoping that restricting the supply of labor would drive up salaries as owners bid for an annual finite pool of free agents. Miller's hopes were frustrated for a time as baseball owners engaged in collusion, in which they agreed among themselves not to deal with any player who was a free agent. Miller led the Ball Players Union in two more actions against Major League owners, the second during the 1980 spring training, and the third during the heart of the 1981 regular season. The 1981 strike, which lasted 50 days, forced the total cancellation of 713 games, and is estimated to have cost both owners and players $146 million. Under Marvin Miller's 16-year tenure as the executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association, the owners engaged in two lockouts, the one in 1973 spring training and the other in the 1976 spring training, both the result of negotiations for collective bargaining agreements. So as far as... uh, Miller's legacy during Miller's tenure as the executive director of the MLBPA, the average player's annual salary rose from $19,000 in 1966 to $326,000 in 1982. Miller taught MLB players the basics of human capital as a commodity. They were selling to club owners, working with the MLBPA general counsel. Richard M. Moss. Miller educated the players to to trade union thinking. Moss was one of Miller's most trusted advisors, advisors at the MLBPA. Richard M. Moss later went on to become a MLB agent. The 1968 collective bargaining agreement was the first of its kind in pro sports. In 1970, players gained the right to have grievances heard by impartial arbitrators in 1973. They achieved a l- limited right to have salary demands subject to arbitration. Uh, Miller said, I'm proudest of the fact that I've been retired for almost 29 years at this point, and there are knowledgeable observers who say that this might still be the strongest union in the country. I think that's a great legacy. MLB is the only professional sport in in the United States not to have a salary cap. Although competitive balance tax has been implemented since 2002, whereby any teams that exceed a mutually agreed upon amount in total salaries are are assessed the tax, which is paid to MLB and put in industry growth fund to keep the sport competitive. Former MLB commissioner Faye Vincent said upon learning of Miller's death in 2012, I think he is the most important baseball figure 
of the last 50 years. He changed not just the sport, but the business of the sport permanently. He truly emancipated the baseball player and, in the process, all professional athletes. Prior to this time, they had few rights. At the moment, they control the games. His nemesis through the 1970s, MLB Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, was not so kind. I began to realize we had before us an old-fashioned 19th century trade unionist who hated management generally and the management of baseball specifically, Kuhn said of Miller in his memoir. Marvin Miller was succeeded in 1985 by uh, Donald Fear who had joined the Major League Baseball Players Association as a general counsel in 1977. Miller, even after retiring, remained close with his successor as a consultant. Fuhrer stepped down in 2009 and was replaced by the union's general counsel, Michael Wiener. Hall of Fame Consideration So in 2000, Hank Aaron endorsed Miller's selection to the Baseball Hall of Fame, saying Marvin Miller should be in the Hall of Fame if players have to break down the doors to get him in. Tom Seaver said Marvin's exclusion from the Hall of Fame is a national disgrace. Joe Morgan said they should vote him in and then apologize for making him wait so long. Broadcaster Bob Costas observed there is... No non-player more deserving of the Hall of Fame. So as far as the 2003 and 2007 balloting, Miller fell short of selection to the Hall of Fame in both 2003 and 2007. In 2007, he finished as the top executive with 63% of the vote. Election again requires 75% of the vote. The 2003 and and seven votes were conducted among a committee of all living Hall of Famers, who are primarily players. Commissioner of Baseball Bud Selig told the Associated Press in 2007, the criteria for non-playing personnel is the impact they made on the sport. Therefore, Marvin Miller should be in the Hall of Fame on that basis. Maybe there are not a lot of my predecessors who would agree with that, but if you're looking for people who make an impact on the sport, yes, you would have to say that. So in the 2008 and 2010 balloting, after they failed to agree on any candidate, including Miller, the voting body was reduced to 12 members, 10 of them non-playing. CNN money writer Chris Isidore described the switches to affect Switch's effect on Miller's candidacy. Imagine a runner rounding third and heading home only to have a last minute rule change move the location of the plate. That's roughly what happened to Marvin Miller's chance of getting a long overdue recognition in base- the Baseball's Hall of Fame. Asked to predict his chances before his The first results under a new revised voting format had been announced. Miller said, let me point out one thing. In the last vote, the number of management people among the voters was a certain percentage. On the new committee, management is competitively dominant, is completely dominant. Aside from miracles, there's no reason to believe the vote will do anything but go down. Miller was up for election in 2008 under the revamped voting format, but received only three of the necessary nine votes, referring to the 12-man voting board, Jim Booten said. How did these people vote, and why are their votes kept secret? And why aren't more players on that committee? Hank Aaron, Jim Bunning, Bob Gibson, Fergie Jenkins... They're all on the committee for reviewing the managers and umpires. Essentially, the decision for putting a union leader in the Hall of Fame was handed over to a bunch of executives and former executives. Marvin Miller kicked their butts and took power away from the baseball establishment. Do you really think people are going to vote him in? It's a joke. I blame the players. It's their Hall of Fame. It's their balls and bats that make the Hall what it is. Where are the public outcries from Joe Morgan or Reggie Jackson, who was a a player rep? Why don't these guys see some of their own to get 
on these committees. That's the least they owe Marvin Miller. Do they think they became millionaires because of owner's generosity? On July 11th, 2008, the Boston Globe portrayed Miller as disdainful of the realignment of the Hall's veteran com- Veterans Committee, as uninterested in the chances of his own enshrinement. I find myself unwilling to contemplate one more rigged Veterans Committee whose members are handpicked to reach a particular outcome while offering a pretense of a Democratic vote. It is an insult to baseball fans, historians, sports writers, and especially to those baseball players who sacrificed and brought the game into the 21st century. At the age of 91, I can do without farce. On this, in December 2009, in voting for the 2010 class of the Hall of Fame, Miller received seven votes from the 12 committee members, falling short of the nine votes needed for election. On April 14, 2010, Miller's 93rd birthday, a group of former major leaguers launched a website called thanksmarvin.com. The site includes appreciations from retired players and advocates for Miller's induction to the Hall of Fame. 2011 and 2014 balloting. Further changes were made to the Veterans Committee voting process in 2010. Effective with the 2011 induction cycle, Miller was named as one of 12, 12 figures from what the Hall calls the Expansion Era, 1973 through the present to be considered. The composition of the new 16-man voting committee was very different from that in 2007, consisting of eight Hall of Famers, seven inducted as players, and one as a manager, four media members, and only four executives. Despite the changes, Miller again missed out on election, this time falling one vote short of induction. Miller died in November 2012. He was promiscuously listed on the expansion era ballot for the 2014 class, but received fewer than seven of 16 votes and was again not elected. So in 2018 and 2020... In July 2016, the Hall of Fame announced changes to the ERA committee system. The system's time frames were in restructured with Miller to be evaluated by the Modern Baseball Era Committee, considering candidates whose greatest contributions occurred from 1970 to 1987. Miller again fell short in the Modern Baseball Era Committee balloting for 2018 receiving only 7 of 16 votes with 12 votes necessary for election. He was again on the Modern Baseball Era Committee ballot for 2020 and was successfully elected with 12 of 16 votes in December 2019. So that gives you um, his information there. In 1997, the MLB Players Association... Uh, created the Marvin Miller Man of the Year Award as one of its annual Player's Choice Awards. On April 1st, 2000, he was honored by the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Miller was inducted into the Baseball's Reliquaries Shrine of the Eternals in 2003, and then on April 26, 2009, he was inducted into the National Jewish Sports Hall. Hall of Fame. As far as some personal notes, Miller was married to Teresa Morgenstern for 70 years, and the couple had two children, Peter and Susan. Teresa predeceased Marvin. Peter Miller, his son, represented the baseball players in Japan. Miller was diagnosed with liver cancer in August 2012. He died November 27, 2012, at the age of 95 in his hometown, in his home in Manhattan. In a statement, Michael Weiner, the executive director of the MLB Players Association, said, It is with profound sorrow that we announce the passing of Marvin Miller. 
all players past, present, and future owe a debt of gratitude to Marvin, and his influence transcends baseball. Marvin, without question, is largely responsible for ushering in the modern era of sports, which has resulted in tremendous benefits to players, owners, and fans of all sports. All right, who jumped in here? Austin Farmer, actually able to make this one. Lurking though, not able to chat. No problem, Austin. Thanks for hopping in here with us this morning. Um, do appreciate you being here. All right. So let me see. I think I've got everything. Yes, I did get everything that I needed to go over here. Um... Yes. <clears throat> so there you have it. Sorry, I needed a sip of water there. Needed a little bit of a sip of water. <clears throat> but there we go. That is um, today's uh, baseball player, in parentheses, executive biography of Marvin julian miller and why he was inducted into the uh, baseball hall of fame finally in 2020 getting to the nose to the vote the 75 percent he needed from the modern baseball era committee which again that committee basically uh goes from 1970 three to the present so since he fell into that group in that era that's why he was included in that voting process now again just to give you an idea since they implemented implemented um that um from the expansion era to to date um that committee consisted of 16 people, and just this year, he actually got 12 out of the 16 votes, which gave him 75% right on the button. Lucky Hosting Solutions. Lucky Hosting Solutions. There we go. That seems like somebody new in the channel. How are you doing there, Lucky Hosting Solutions? Thanks for joining us this morning. Let me just check something out here real quick. Don't believe... Yeah. All right, Lucky Hosting Solutions, appreciate you stopping by today. Um, like, comment, and subscribe on the channel, and I'll be sure I get back to you on your channel. Okay, appreciate you being here today, joining in with us. I do a, a sports type. Oh, you've been following me for a while. Thank you there, Lucky Hosting Solutions. Appreciate that. Um, I will definitely um, check your channel out. All right. So let's see, I, I'm trying to think of what else to talk about here. Um, for today, I didn't really have too much scheduled. I have to record some more episodes for my 5 a.m. content that gets loaded up daily. Um, so yeah, other than that, if there is anything else you guys want to talk about in the channel, I'm willing to do that. Um, in a minute or so here, I can turn the camera around. Um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta try and really get some c baseball cards sorted today from some of my prior breaks that I've done in the last couple months. They've just been stacking up on the side over here. So I do need to work on that. Let me, um, there we go. Get, get me in the camera here. Of course, I'm, I'm wearing one of my other Hall of Fame hats here. In case you're wondering which hat this is, put it up here on the screen. 
It's from the 2007 inductees. All right, a couple years back. We are up to 2020 here now. But yes, get this lined up here. So this is pretty much the, sh the shirt I wear with um, when I do the biographies um, video series, which take place on Thursdays. Um, as of now, I have no fan mail Friday packages for tomorrow. I do have something coming in uh, very soon. Um, but yeah, this is a, a another new hat. This was down in one of my closets downstairs. I broke it out today because this was a little bit different. So I wanted to do something different with a different baseball cap to add to my repertoire here. Um, I do have Griffey's hat. All right. Now I have this one here. This, of course, here has on it uh, Bagwell, Reigns, Rodriguez, Sherholtz, and Bud Selig from 2017. So, yeah. That's who's included here. Um, I'm going to start collecting Gossage. Oh, Goose Gossage. Yes, as I want to really be the goose. The goose bee. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that, is that Kevin that's calling you the goose? The goose is on the loose. The goose is in the house. That's just like uh, Bobby C. Bobby, uh, she's called the Gypsy Queen. I think that's neat how uh, Kevin comes up with nicknames for people in the channels. That's pretty cool. But yeah, so... Um, for tomorrow, um, if I do not have anything that comes in today for uh, Family Mail Call Fridays, I will probably open up some Topps product. Probably I got I got a Top Series One box and a Topps Update box I could open tomorrow, or I do have a couple of Fairfield boxes I could open up a Fairfield box, but we will see. I will have something planned and something scheduled for tomorrow that's for sure i gotta go run out today and do an errand or two so um that's what i plan on doing um when i do get done today i gotta get some some paper to do some financial reports and reporting for our church as the church treasurer to be able to uh, get all our reports for our business meeting to close out 2019 for our church records but other than that, I can't really think of anything else to talk about. Well, that's nice to know, Sally, that you're looking into Goose Gossage now. All right. Um, I do have Goose Gossage. Let me see here. Yeah, I do have some Goose Gossage baseball cards. I'll probably highlight him one of these days uh, when I can organize. I don't have a whole lot in my Goose Gossage uh, baseball cards but I do have a few over on the side here maybe about a handful 25 30 maybe just shy maybe about 50 somewhere around there so I do have some goose gossage um, what do you think about the Astros and the Red Sox uh, I don't know for sure lucky it's kind of mixed I mean yeah, they're using cameras and getting into the more technical side of stealing signs. I mean, they've, they've been stealing signs for years, for quite a few years. But as far as the using the, the different ways that they're doing it, I don't know. I think it's starting to get a little bit out of hand. If they, if they would have kept it on the sly and if the, it wasn't made such a big deal, I think nobody would have known about anything. I mean... That's why a lot of times when they go out to the pitcher's mound, you know, they're covering their mouth so they know somebody's trying to read their lips to see what they're saying and stuff. They don't know what they're saying. So, I mean, you know, or they'll do like this or, you know, just kind of hover around so they can't see what the pitchers are they're talking about on the mound um, <clears throat> or how they want to pitch to somebody to make sure they don't get a hit. I mean, you know, it's just... I think it's got blown more out of proportion than it really should be. But with all that being said, um, there's always going to be different things that take place in baseball. I mean, you've had the problem with Sabo before with the cork bats. He didn't know it was. The ball 
boy grabbed the wrong bat. Maybe it was a batting practice bat. But even if that's the case, I mean, they shouldn't have had that bat in the dugout if it was just used for batting practice. Keep that stuff in, in the locker room. Bring it out when you're doing batting practice. Um, but different things throughout the years, yes. You have problems. You have uh, controversies. Of course, they tie that in with, uh, oh, betting on baseball all those different instances. Now the PEDs, I can see that one. That one there, performance enhanced drugs. You know, MLB has said you're not supposed to be using that stuff. So if you get caught using it, you broke the rules. Um, but yeah, everybody says, well, if you let somebody in that uh, did do it and admitted to doing it, but then they just got a slap on a hand. There's so many different avenues you can go on uh, even with that guy wearing a buzzer under his jersey. Oh, boy. You know, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but, yeah, there's always going to be instances. I mean, if you have to cheat in baseball um, to get numbers, to get things to go your way, um, and then you do get caught, the best thing is to just not do it to begin with. So, I mean, that's why that's why there's rules and regulations. That's why when a baseball player does retire, part of the, the whole process of uh, eventually making it into the Hall of Fame is making your mark in baseball after you retire. What are you doing to continue uh, promoting, continue helping with the sport? That's why players need to be involved in the process. Not just retire and say, okay, I'm done with baseball. Thank you for all the money you gave me, and I'm good to go now. I'm going to just go off to the side and be forgotten. And that's why they get forgotten. So, yeah, there's so many different aspects. Remember, it is a baseball. With this Marvin Miller being inducted into the Hall of Fame, he made a difference. Uh, did the owners and the... Uh, the management of baseball appreciate what he did? Of course they did not. That would take from their bottom line. But who who does the fans support? The owners or the managers or the players that are doing all the hard work? I'm not saying that management doesn't do hard work. The owners don't help promote the team, help to get a good team to put together, of course. But you look at the New York Yankees. They have lots of money. That's why they can attract the players. They can bring them to the New York Yankees. They can bring them to Boston. Uh, with the things with Houston, that's why they can bring them to Houston. If they got money to, to field a good team and a great team, that's going to attract people to go there. Um, uh, that's why you don't see team loyalty much anymore. It's wherever they can get more money, that's where the players are going to go. It's not all about the money. It has to be about the love of the sport. And that's what I like sharing the history of baseball on my channel. To keep the history of the sport alive. alive. But if the players don't perform, that means squat. Exactly. Um, they couldn't just leave it or they would have roasted. <laughs> they had to do something. Yes, that's why people like Marvin Miller and ones like that that try to level the playing field and make it more fair for the owners, the players. It just helps the overall around process. So yeah, with that in mind, that was nice. To, thank you for uh, asking uh, the question there, Lucky Solutions. Lucky Hosting Solutions, I appreciate you asking that. I don't mind uh, sharing my thoughts on the overall process. Um, but yeah, so other than that, let's see. Um, yes, so um, next week for our Hall of Fame inductees, we'll be continuing in our series. And we will be going back into 1982 for tomorrow's, or for next when next For, um, for 
for next. All right, I'm getting something lined up so I can show you just a sneak preview of who I'm going to highlight um, next Wednesday for our Hall of Fame induction series. Again, with that series, um, I just shrunk it down again. There we go. Ah, sorry. Trying to give you a sneak peek for into next week's Hall of Fame induction series, which will be the 1982 Hall of Fame inductees. All right, I want to try and just show you a snapshot. Ah, oh, come on, why aren't you working with me? No. Anywho, it's 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 being picky on me now. Just something to talk about. E exactly, and I appreciate that, Lucky Hosting Solutions. Um, I don't mind fielding questions in the channel, um, answering any questions people might have, if it's within my ability to do so. I don't mind checking that out in none the least. Um, hold on. I'm going to try one more time here and see if I can... Uh, Get that lined up. All right. So let me turn the camera around real quick, and I'll give you a sneak peek into into next week's Hall of Fame induction series. Continue again in my Hall of Fame induction series that I've done on my channel. I've started with 2019 last year when those that were in. Uh, inducted in with uh, Edgar Martinez and the ones that were inducted then and each year each week I go back in time so next week will be 1982 let me just uh, turn this around real quick here so you can kind of see actually I should have realigned this right down here there you go so those will be the inductees for next week 1982 it will be Hank Aaron. Um, we will have another executive, Happy Chandler. But unfortunately, I think I have probably his tombstone count, uh, card there, uh, uh, Sally. But I'll look and see if I do have one in my Hall of Fame card separation. Sometimes they do have cards for executives and stuff. But we will see what I can find. And then Travis Jackson. So, of course, Hank Aaron, 1982 Milwaukee Braves when they were in Milwaukee. Happy Chandler, 1982, an executive. Travis Jackson, 1982, with the New York Giants. He was a shortstop. And then Frank Robinson, with this, inducted in 1982, with the Cincinnati Reds. He was a right fielder. So that will be... I like that. They got the Cincinnati Reds there. But I think, isn't that a Baltimore ball cap he's wearing? The Baltimore Orioles? I think Frank Robinson also played for the the Baltimore Orioles, I believe. But that's neat. He's got a Baltimore Orioles hat on. Um, Hank Aaron's got, I think that might be the Milwaukee Braves emblem. Then, of course, the New York Giants, Travis Jackson there. So that will be, yeah. Hope, well, just pray that I can find um, Happy Chandler, a baseball card there. I don't really want to look right now, but, uh, well... Here, the camera's turned around. Let me check real quick. That way you'll know for next week there, Sally. Let me look just to see Chandler. Chandler. Let me see if I might have one. No, I don't have one. But at least he's a happy person. At least he's a happy person. You can see that in the picture there, Sally. Happy Chandler is happy. He's got a smile on his page on this particular uh, picture. But yeah, most likely on the tombstone card, uh, he might have a smile if he's that smiley type. Look, at least all three of these, except for Hank Aaron's, got a smile on him. I'll try not to cringe too much. 
<coughs> exactly, Sally. Well, I do appreciate everybody that did show up today. Uh, we do have a few more people lurking in the background, but that's fine. They're probably at work or busy. So I do honor that and don't expect everybody to chat in in the channel if they can't that is fine but um dragon fan tim uh oh he put a link in here um ebay i ebay dot com images must have been dragon fan tim lurking in the background um what's Let me see what you what you got going on here, there, Dragon Fan. Oh, Happy Chandler. Oh, okay, is that? Oh, that's a Topps baseball card. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have one of those. So that's a nice looking card, of Revolution of the Game. Happy Chandler. I remember thinking I'm going to have to meet my maker someday, and if he asked me why didn't I let this guy play. And I said, because he's black, that might not be a satisfactory answer. That is really cool. Here, I'll show you that real quick. This is the link that Dragon Fan Tim just sent me on that. I'm going looking at my computer here. So Tops did make a baseball card with Happy Chandler on it. So that is a cool looking card. This I'm showing this for Sally. Uh, oh, tops, 2019. Oh, it's a 2019 tops. It's on eBay for a dollar thirty-five. Wow. Well, I definitely didn't pull one of those out of 2013, or I would have put it in my Hall of Fame separation, because I do have a marker card for that. He's a good man. I like him already. There we go, Sally. That is Happy Chandler. So anybody, if anybody found or has a Happy Chandler Hall of Fame card, I wouldn't mind adding it to my repertoire. Um, I could probably almost buy it off eBay, but I'll, it may or may not make it in time for next week's video. But that is nice to know. Thanks there. Uh, appreciate that, Dragon Fan Tim. Yeah, 2019... Tops. It's on eBay for a dollar thirty-five. Okay, let me um just check something real quick here. I'm gonna pan this down for just a second. Let's see. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Let me go out of here. Chandler. Oh. oh, okay, there we go. There's the link. Dun, dun. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Dragon Fan Tim, for that. I will uh, definitely work on that and look ahead for future episodes to see if I can find other cards that are at a reasonable price. That's, that that was actually pretty good. It was not that expensive for that single card. They'll probably mail it to me in an, in an envelope. We'll see if we get it in time there, Sally. That way you won't have a tombstone. <laughs> All right, so there we go. We'll see what happens there. Can't wait, I'll be here. What was that? Somebody asked you a question here? Um, yeah, they creep me out. I laugh out loud. <laughs> oh, Sally. I know, you don't like those Hall of Fame uh, postcards. That's my backup. That's definitely my backup. So there we go. Yes. Well, we're going to go ahead and get ready to finish things up. I do... Uh, have a few more minutes before my hour mark to try and get an hour in on my when I do my streams. So there we go. That's a sneak preview for next week when we do Hank Aaron, Happy Chandler, Travis Jackson, and Frank Robinson. I know I've got Hank Aaron cards. I've got Frank Robinson cards. Let's see. Travis Jackson, I believe I do. Yes. Yes. Travis Jackson, I do. So yeah, that's the only one I would have to use a uh, a tombstone card. <laughs> a Hall of Fame postcard that has the player on there. Pretty much, uh, pretty much on the postcard uh, set that I have for the Hall of Famers, it shows their, their Hall of Fame plaque in Cooperstown. Uh, along with information on the back of the postcard. It's just like a regular postcard you would buy in a, a shop and stuff. So, um, yeah. That's pretty much what takes place there. So now, without further ado, let me reposition the camera here. Get ready to say my sign-off for today. If you have to, okay, um, well, yeah, we'll see. It might come in in time. I ordered one. I'm sure the plaques look great. It's just the postcards. Yeah, I know. So here we go. Let me come back in here. Get ready to do my sign off. My two minute warning has just approached. So two minutes until we have an hour in the live. Just would like to go shoot for about that when I do live just to kind of wrap things up so I can get things done through the day sort some baseball cards clear up some spaces on my rack here I gotta figure out how to rearrange things so I can set another 5,000 count box I've got one two three four I've got 4,000 Hall of Fame cards I have to sort pretty much so I do need to get those sorted and get more put into my Hall of Fame separation. Along with my rookie card separation, my star baseball player separation, and my team sorts that I do. So yeah. Other than that, I can't think of anything else to talk about. Don't tell him who you're going to talk about. Who? Who are you talking about? Gotta see you later, guys. Who is the next Hall of Fame players you are going to talk about? Oh, that's next. Well, for the Hall of Fame inductees for 1982. All right, that's the next ones. Um, but yeah, I have, I have a list of different players that people have requested me to do and that I've added to the list myself. Um, that's why I kind of did wanted to do this one today, um, to just get him 
as to so people would understand why he got in and how he got inducted into the Hall of Fame for 2020. So that was our four players that did get inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2020. Okay, so in case you missed it yesterday, there are Posada. I think this is going to revert, yeah. These were, uh, of course, the new Hall of Famers that got inducted. Um, for the tw class of 2020. Let me back up my camera a little bit here. There you go. These are the four uh, Hall of Famers that got inducted. Of course, everybody knows Alex Rodriguez did. Marvin Miller, Ted Simmons, and Larry Walker are our four new 2020 Hall of Fame inductees. I recorded that yesterday on my video when I did the 2020 Hall of Fame inductees video series. So that's what we were talking about there, Sally. Okay. So thanks. Uh, gotta go. See, guy, see you later, guys and girls. And thank you there, Lucky Hosting Solutions. Appreciate you stopping by. Really do appreciate you stopping by. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera back around. Say my goodbyes, and we will see you guys tomorrow, okay? So you guys take care. Have a great and wonderful day, and we will see you tomorrow for my fan mail, or family mail call Friday videos. If we have anything to open, if not, I will open up some baseball card product, okay? So you guys have a great and wonderful day, and we will see you around the channels, okay? Bye now, and take care.